morning, everyone. This is the Newport News Church of Christ. And once again, we're certainly thankful that God has blessed us to arise and see another beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful to you who are watching virtually uh, that you have decided to join in with us in our study that we've been studying here lately in the book of Malachi. If you have your Bibles, too, please turn to Malachi chapter 3. Uh, we'll continue our discussion from last week. As you know, last week, the title of the discussion was about be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. And so God's people had made an accusation against God, against his character, about him not being righteous as far as uh, administering proper judgment against those who appear to be prospering um, in their surrounding nations uh, who were wicked. And so it, to them, it appeared that God was validating their behavior and their livelihood. But these people were wrong. God's people were wrong in this matter. Uh, yes, a uh, hundred years had passed since the Babylonian captivity and uh, we don't see the problem of idolatry right now, but then there are all those slew of sins that these people, God's people, the priests, as well as the people were guilty of. So as I was saying earlier, uh, we've been discussing uh, the accusations that God's people had made against him. And so we want to pick up now and go to slide six. We want to pick up where we left off last week. There you go. And who will pass the inspection? Excellent. And so as we look at this study of God's people, let's look at verses two and three of Malachi chapter three, where God is actually replying back to uh, the children of Judah and the priests is those leaders as well as the people. And Malachi now states this unto them, but who may ab abide the day of his coming? Well, first of all, Malachi informs them that God is going to send a messenger. But this is someone other than Malachi. Now, of course, this is not going to happen until sometime later, 400 and some years later, when finally John the Baptist comes on the scene and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would be <clears throat> the messenger uh, of the Lord. But then there would be another messenger because John the Baptist was who? The forerunner. So John the Baptist would come preaching, preparing the way of the Lord. And then the Lord will come on the scene, and he is the messenger, remember last week, of the covenant. Jesus is the messenger of the covenant. And so now let's look at verses two and three. Today we'll be looking at these as we make some applications. In verse two, but who may abide the day of his coming? Who's coming? Talking about the Lord's. So this is going to happen sometime later in the future, actually. Who's going to buy in the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Did you get something there? Those who are with me here today and those who are watching. Notice what God is looking for. God is looking for an offering in righteousness. These people were guilty of that, weren't they? They, they didn't offer their offerings in righteousness. What, what was the problem with the people in Malachi's day? What was wrong with their offering? Remember that? Think about it just for a moment. It was a several lessons back. Remember, they offered defective offerings. They did not offer their best. When they went out to look at the lamb and the, and the sheep, they, they went and got the sick ones. They didn't get, they, they got the ones that were, had blemishes. They did not offer God their best. And so they were dishonoring God. And that's the problem. You see, I told you a while back, sometimes when sin takes hold 
uh, we seem to deteriorate in our spiritual walk. It cascades. So now, what is God saying? God is answering, answering them right now. He says, I'm going to justify things here. I'm going to bring justice. Justice is coming. You know, we often say when we look in our land and a, and a, and a judgment has been passed, maybe someone in court who was on trial, and then there appears to be an uproar because everyone doesn't feel like the justice was served. My brother. And those of you who are watching, one day justice will be served. And the Lord Almighty God is going to get it right. And, and the first time in all of man and humanity and all of anyone's existence, on that day, judgment, God, when he makes his pronouncement, will be correct. But now, when Christ gets here, of course, that's what we're talking about here in these verses, Christ will address the sin issue. You see, in verse six, we learned that there is something about God that they should have known. God tells them in verse six, I am the Lord God. He's identifying himself. And, and you know, Christ, they knew about God and they heard about God. But God says, I'm the Lord God and I change not. What are we talking about? The immutability of God. God, he's not like us. God is true to the nth degree. God is not wishy-washy. There's no flaw in God's character. We talked about that. That's why we can put our confidence in God and trust God in the matter. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Why aren't they consumed? Because God is a merciful God. That's right. God is a merciful God. And though we may... Uh, do things that will spur on his wrath, God still is merciful toward us. And God is still merciful toward his people. Why? Because God has a purpose. It was these people that God had chosen to allow what? His seed to eventually come. Isn't that correct? That's right. You remember what seed would that be? Christ. That's right. The Lord. It was through this lineage, through God's people that Christ would eventually come. Well, what is Christ going to do? Well, he's going to purify and cleanse. He will purge the hypocrisy. You know, what God knows that these people should have known, because Jeremiah had wrote this and mentioned this in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. How is it that God is going to purge and cleanse? Well, first of all, God knows what's going on in your heart. See, not we can't say that. We're humans. We don't have that ability. But God knows what's going on in your heart. Notice what Jeremiah said. He said, the heart is deceitful and above all things, desperately wicked. You see, you don't hear that. That's not a, a, a common everyday language you hear about man in general. This is talking about all men, not a certain ethnic group. It's talking about all mankind. What does God say through Jeremiah? He said that the heart, he said that the heart is deceitful and above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, that person knows himself. He knows what's going on in his heart, his mind. But there's someone else that knows too. Matter of fact, he knows better than we do. And the Bible says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, that's the deepest recesses of the thoughts and the intents of man. He says here, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Yes. And then when Christ comes on the scene, we learn that Christ knew what was in man. So here, see, what we're talking about is an inspection. You got to be careful what you ask for now. You want God to be just. You want God to manifest his righteousness. God is informing these people of this day that I'm going to inspect. That's right. And I'm capable of inspecting who you are. See, 
Jesus, watch what it says here in Jude. Now let's look at this inspector. Look at Christ now. Look at John 2, 24, 24. I'm getting excited. I'm excited about this. Aren't you all excited? Aren't you excited when you study the Bible? We ought to be. Because when we study God's word, we learn something. We learn something about God. And we want to learn where we stand with God. We want to make sure that our lives align to his will. That's right. Watch what the Bible says about Jesus. John records this. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, verse 24, John chapter 2, because he knew, watch this, he knew all men. See, I, none of us can make that statement. I don't know all men. Do you know all men? No, but the Lord does. Because of what I said back in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Jeremiah said, who can know the heart? The Lord says, I know and I search it to try man. Yes. Jesus said that he, that he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man. For he knew, watch this now. Now we get a little deeper. He knew what was in man. Brethren, does the Lord know who you are? You better believe he does. He knows every little intricate detail about you. He knows things about you maybe your spouse don't know, but the Lord knows. Those secret things that maybe no one else knows about you, but the Lord knows. You see, in, in the eyes of God, nothing is hidden. The Lord sees all things. There's nothing hidden from his sight. That should cause us to take a retrospect of examining. You know that verse that we, we read, I haven't heard it later, but we read it from time to time. You know that verse in the old 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse five? What did Paul instruct the church there? Anybody know what that is? Go ahead, Travis. Huh? He said, let us do what? Examine ourselves. What does the rest of us say? Huh? That's right. He says, examine yourself. See whether you be in faith so that you don't be what? Uh, reprobate. Ah. You see, we should constantly examine ourselves in light of God's word. Isn't that correct? That's correct. So here we have the inspection going. Jesus knows man. So he qualifies to be the one. So the Lord is still inspecting hearts today, isn't he? Yes. All right. Now, God hasn't stopped. You know why? Because of his immutability. God has not changed from back in the Old Testament times to the New Testament times. We still say, serve the same God who was back then is here now. That same God. And what does the Hebrew writer tell us in Hebrews 4.12? Remember what the Hebrew writer told them in Hebrews chapter 4.12? Those who were almost guilty of going back to apotheosizing, going back into Judaism. The whole purpose of the book of Hebrews is to show the purity of the priesthood of Christ versus the Levitical priesthood. Did you know that? The gospel versus the law. And so when you read the book of Hebrews, you will come to find out that it was only there for a reason. And that was to what? Manifest or illustrate the, the terribleness of sin. Read that in Galatians chapter three. And then we get here to the book of Hebrews now. He says here, he says, verse 11. Let's look at verse 11. We always read verse 12, but look at verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into his rest. Well, you know, in the previous chapter, we, we receive a warning how that they provoke God. Who are we talking about? Those children of Israel as they were trying to go into the promised land. Okay, they, they didn't trust God. What was their problem? They had a heart of unbelief. That's the problem, the heart of unbelief. And so then as you keep reading, you get all the way here to chapter four, the Hebrew writer here says, now here is a, Scripture of encouragement to the children of that day, as well as us who are part of God's family. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Labor. Watch this. That 
any man fall after the same example of unbelief. We don't want to fall under the example of unbelief. Even though we started on our way, we've left Egypt, and we're on our way to where? Heaven, the promised land right now. You haven't gotten there yet. Why? Because you are saved by hope. Learn that in Romans 8, 24 and 25. And hope is something you expect, you look forward to, something you have not uh, achieved yet. We are saved by hope on the promises of God. God promises to save us on the condition of our obedience to him. Isn't that correct? All right. Hope is not something you see. Hope don't even look in the past. Hope doesn't even look at today. No, hope looks towards something. What keeps me faithful, faithful is my hope and being with God in the end. That's, that's your hope. What did John say? Every man that have this hope, listen to it, purify himself. Think about that just for a moment. It is hope that is the anchor of the soul that keeps us stable as we are on our way to heaven so that we don't be tossed to and fro. Stability in our life. Isn't that a, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Man, you go out on that boat and you want to stay in a certain spot, don't put that anchor down. You ain't going to stay there. The current will carry you and you'll just be drifting. We don't want to be drifting, brother. No, sir. We want to be anchored. That's right. And guess what? And that anchor, see, once it goes down in the water, it goes out of your sight, doesn't it? Where is your anchor? At? Better, I hope it is in heaven. Hmm. Anchor to the Lord, right? All right now. So now what does, watch what the Hebrew writer writes here in Hebrews 4.12. As we think about this inspection, watch what he says. For the word of God is quick. That means living. It's active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the sunder, dividing the sun of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God is active. And that's why when people hear the truth, they have a certain reaction. Remember that lesson my brother Dismute? You know, they're either going to be mad or they're going to be glad or sad. Now, one of those three is going to take place when people hear God's word in light of it. You see, when God's word is presented, it shines a light. That's right. It illuminates. It illuminates the, the darkness. What's the darkness? The ignorance of our thinking. The entrance of thy word, why it says, giveth light. Did you know that? You start to see a little something differently now. And so God's word illuminates. So God here is as an inspector. One day there will be one final inspection, won't there? Remember John 12, 48? Oh man, we've heard that quite a bit. Yes, yeah, sir, John 12, 48. You, you remember what that says? Anybody can remember? It's, it's been quoted from that pulpit. Want me to start it off for you? He that rejecteth. Does that sound familiar? Of course. He that rejecteth me, and what? Receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. For the word I have spoken, the same shall what? Judge him in that final day. Well, why is that? Why, yeah, okay, now the word of God is right, but you know what? We always stop at 48, but let's move on just a little bit. And, and Jesus is going to explain why. Look at verse 49. He says, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Now, is that true? Of course that's true. Why? Why is that true? Think about it just for a minute. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. And Jesus is referring to the Father, as Emmett was saying just a minute ago. Now, what's, what's one immutable thing you know about God? Huh? That's right. It's impossible for him to lie. 
So this commandment that Jesus received, now watch what Jesus said. He said he didn't even speak of himself. He spoke as the father spoke to him and, with, and the commandment that he gave him. And he told him what he should say and what he should speak. You know, most people don't even know that. You'd be surprised. Most people. Well, with Jesus, he was God. Okay, God in the flesh, but he, he didn't speak of himself. Jesus said that. That's right here in your Bible. He said that. He didn't speak of himself. Well, well, look at verse 50. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. You hear that? And whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said to me, so I speak. The commandment is life everlasting. That's why you do well to take heed what the Lord has said. You do well to take heed unto it. Well, John 12, 48, that's that final inspection now. It's going to be one. What about that verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 10 there? Y'all, that's a familiar verse. For those of you who are watching, that may not be familiar with you, but Paul speaking to the church at Corinth informs them. He says, for we must all, notice, he says, for we, well, who is Paul speaking to? He's talking to Christians. Who is the we? It's the church there at Corinth, right? And subsequently, all the other churches of the Lord, when these epistles are what? Passed around. This apply. Does that apply to us? Because we're members of the Lord's church, right? So just as it applied to them in the first century, it applies to us today. That's right. He says, what? For we must all, notice he used the, the plural pronoun, we. It does good to understand your words, get you an understanding. Paul didn't say, you will appear. He said, we, you know what? He included himself. He's not exempt. None of us are exempt. And then there's an inclusive phrase in there, for we must all, you hear it? Everyone's going to appear. No one is going to miss this. Everybody will be there. We must all appear, watch this. What does it say? Before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he have done, whether it be what? Good or bad. All right. So there's going to be a final inspection. And then we, these people here in Malachi's day, I remember now the fallacy of that accusation that God is not righteous. God has a perfect track record, doesn't he? That's right. He's the only one that has a perfect track record. You know, when I think about that, that part about no one's going to be exempt from this. He's going to deal with the leaders of the Levites and that whole nation. He's going to purify the sons of Levi so that they could offer proper worship. You know, when one's life is spiritually out of order, their worship is out of order. Was their worship out of order? Yes, it was. It was out of order. You see, God is looking for true worshipers. Now, you need to let that sink in. You see, we quote that a lot, don't we? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. I just hope and pray it ain't falling on deaf ears. You need to take it to heart. Who is God looking for? True worshipers. John 4, 20. Who did Jesus tell that to? He told it to that woman at the well. Remember what she had said? Well, our father said we should worship in this mountain. Jesus said, you know not where you worship. You don't know who you worship. Remember, he, 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 he reproved on that. But there's going to come a time we're not going to worship in the mountain. We're not going to worship just here in Jerusalem. Wherever the Lord's church is, that's where God's worship is. Wherever there. Yeah, we, don't, we ain't got to run back to, to Jerusalem, to Israel, to the, the so-called holy land. <laughs> you know where the holy place is now? It's the church. That's right. You know, God moved from time. Baby, go back. God had his place here at Mount Sinai. Then he moved it here. And then eventually he was in Jerusalem. And now where is it? In the church. Yes, God is going to 
change it. So, you know what's going to happen before I get, I don't want to go too far. You know what's going to happen? Why? Why there's going to be a, a proper offering of worship eventually? And, and why Jesus is on the scene? Because you know what the Lord is getting ready to do? He's getting ready to set up a new order. Did you know that? If you take time and go back and read, that's why I say go back and read the book of Hebrews, you will find out there's going to be a change in the priesthood. Uh-oh, here we go. That's right. And, and God is going to give us the gospel which is not about just meats and offerings and washings as they did under the old law. We won't have to go out and find a lamb of purpose. By. We're going to have a lamb. His name is the Lord, Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. This whole thing is going to change, and this priesthood is going to be under his order. And so now he's going to become what? Our great high priest. And guess what? According to 1 Peter 2, 9, we now are priests, all of us. We make up a royal priesthood. Think about that. When God, God is going to receive his, his worship, it's going to be proper. God is looking for true worshipers. It's going to take place. And by the power of the gospel, God, now when Jesus comes on the scene, he's going to appease to what? the hearts of men and to their character. And Jesus is going to be that perfect example for all men to see to what? Replicate. He's going to be the example for all of us. And so therefore, we can accomplish what God has intended for us and what he had intended for them. But since they were erroneous in their assessment of the Lord. The Lord is saying there's going to come a time that, that justice is going to be prevailed, that just my justice is going to be manifested, and it will be in his son. Well, you think about that just for a minute. Now, you know what the problem we have from time to time, brethren? We get caught up in rituals just like they did. You get caught up in rituals. We got to be careful that we don't get caught up in rituals. You see, God wants us to understand that a ritual is never an acceptable substitute for true worship. Now, now God asked them to do certain things. Yeah, they follow it. But is that the, 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 the extent of your worship? Think about this just for a minute. Coming to worship Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night, actually, who does that impress? You think that impresses God that you hear Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday evening? Yes, now the elders may say, okay, let's meet Sunday. That's what God has prescribed for us to meet on the first day of the week. Now, and then some, and some of the elders and leaders, they meet again in the evening. And then meet midweek Bible study. But you know, that, that appeases to us. That makes us feel good. Yeah, I came to worship today. Yeah. And I, I came to offer my worship to God. But do you think that impresses God? All right. You look at it, you say, where are you going with this? I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you in a minute. Coming to every service. Hmm. How about putting a high percentage of your money in the plate? You feel good when you put that in there? Hmm. Oh, are we supposed to give? Of course. Does God address how you give? Yes, he does. He said, don't give grudgingly or of necessity. What type of giver does God love? A cheerful giver. That's right. See, it's not all about the amount that's in the plate. It involves the attitude of the heart when I give. Or singing melodiciously. Oh, you sure are a great singer. You know, the Bible speaks some about that too, how we sing. Remember what Paul told the church grand? For I shall pray in the spirit and I shall sing with the spirit. You see, when, you, when you're offering up saying, you don't want to just offer up lip service. 
Your singing has to come from the heart. Remember now, God is looking at your heart. If you're singing, trying to impress someone in the assembly, God is not accepting that. He didn't ask you to be Whitney Houston or some of the, we look at as great singers of our lifetime. That's not what God, God wants you to sing. Yes, that's the command. But my question is, is it coming from devotion? Is it coming from the heart? Is it coming from rejoicing because of the fact that you are a child of God and you are singing praises unto God because you love your God? That's why you're singing. You don't care who hear you when you sing. When Paul and Silas sung, here's a good example. Where were they at? Were they in the assembly of the brethren? No, sir. They was in jail. Huh? In jail, rejoicing. Counting it glad to suffer shame on his behalf. That they were worthy. They sung praises in the midst of jail. Think about that for a moment. As I've said before, when the heart is in heaven, it doesn't matter what the external circumstances is. You have something to rejoice about. It may not be in your favor. It may be against you. There may be adversity. But as long as you know you are right with God, you got something to rejoice about, brother. And you know what? We need to start looking like we, we, we're rejoicing. I'm too many brethren. I'm looking at faces all down and frowning like you don't lost all hope. <laughs> Come on now. What's wrong? You know, God always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 2.14, did you know that? That's right. Or praying eloquently. Remember what Jesus admonished? He talked about those who prayed to be seen of men. God wants you to pray from your heart. See, everything involves your heart. He wants you to give your all in it. Or what if you listen to Brother Dismute or to whoever the preacher is, intently, carefully, patiently, you listen to that word? Do you feel justified by hearing it? Well, it's good that you hear it. You, you bless your prophet. Now, the problem is when you hear it, what do you do with what you just heard? That's the key right there. Hmm? Doesn't do any good to sit and hear a great sermon, a great message that you needed to hear, and then you go back out past them doors and the rest of the week, you act just like you did before you got back in here. Mm. When you think about Malachi, so what is it that the Lord, what a peak, what, what is it that, I don't want to use the word impressed, but delights the Lord, that the Lord delights in. You know, the answer is in Micah. Y'all remember that prophet, Micah? Remember that? He spoke during the times of Ahaz, Hezekiah, Jotham. Remember that? Oh, around by 722 B.C. Remember that? He spoke to Israel. And man, Micah said something here. If you, if you can kind of read all of Micah 6, I, we don't have time to read all that. But I want you to just see this as we talk about this subject. You know what? My time is really moving, isn't it? I could use another hour. That's Okay. Lord willing, prayfully, we'll come back next week and continue this discussion. But why am, I, why am I on this so seriously? Because worship is serious. How you come to worship, your attitude, how you come to offer. Watch this, Micah 6. Look at, look at verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? You hear that? Wherewith, when you come to the Lord, you come now to offer your worship, which we're going to do in about a few, you know, about 20, 30 minutes from now. We're going to offer something to God. Right now, we're having a study. We're getting prepared, aren't we? We're in preparation. Do you know before the Lord's day come, you ought to be preparing yourself to approach God? Did you know that? You should be preparing yourself. That's right. And just as you leave today, you strive to live a certain type of life so that when you come back, Lord willing, your worship, your offering will be acceptable to God. Watch this. He says, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams? You see, those are rituals. You see all that? 
That's right. Did God ask him to offer certain things? Yes, he did. These are rituals. Think about that for a minute. Or with 10,000 rivers of oil, all that anointing taking place. He says, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now, what is it that the Lord wants? You need to ask yourself, what is it that God wants from you, from me? What does he want? That's what I need to know. You know, when I hear what the messenger of the covenant, when he was on the scene, I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus said on one occasion, for I always do those things, watch this, which please the father. Is that your admiration? Is that your aspiration? Do you strive from day to day to do everything, whatever you're doing, during the day to please the father? You know why? You're in the house. You're in God's house. You are a representative of his family. Whether you're around all your brethren or you're around your co-workers or you're around your family or you're in your community, wherever you are, you are a representation of the Lord's house. He says, he has showed thee. Watch what Micah tells them at that time. You know, this is about 300 years before Malachi's time. Did you know that? <laughs> Israel had just went into captivity. They're going to Assyria. Judah won't be long falling behind. Babylon won't capture them. But watch this. He says, what has God showed thee, O man? What is good? God has shown what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? This is what God wants. But to do justly. Uh, does that sound familiar? That takes me all the way back to Titus. Chapter 2. Oh, about verse 12. We'll, we'll look at that just for a second. Watch this now. To do justly. And watch this, to love mercy. That's one thing the Lord is going to teach us. When God comes on the scene, Jesus, he's going to teach us how to do justly, to do right by others. And he's going to teach us to love mercy, to have pity on others as well. We need to learn that. Not to devour one another and destroy one another, to have compassion, pity, mercy. That's a part of God's attribute. And you know what? As we call to be our, our children of the Lord, we should have that too, shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't practice that before you came to Christ, but after you come, you get taught, you learn, you train. You should, you should put that in your spirit. Mercy. What does God require of us to do justly, to love mercy, and watch this, to walk humbly with his God? Is that what God's people was doing in Malachi's day? Of course not. That ain't what they were doing. Is that, is that what we're doing? I hope. I hope that's what we're doing. You know, I love that last part. Walk humbly. Mm, you know what that gets rid of? Thinking more of yourself than you are. You know why? Because my righteousness is filthy as rags. That's right. My justification is predicated upon the righteousness of God, not myself. Thank God that he came and redeemed me, redeemed you, and made it possible for the Bible says, for he, he, that thy knew no sin, for he made him, watch this, he made him to do what? Remember that? What's 2 Corinthians 5, 21? Anybody remember that verse? Think about it. For he made him to be sin, watch this now. Now I'm going to try to get y'all to do this. Now, I know you've heard it a lot in the pulpit. For he made him to be sin, watch this, who knew no sin, that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. There it is. Does that, did that sound familiar? Oh, man. Aren't you glad the Lord came? Man, you need to be rejoicing. That's right. God made it possible so that you can be right with him. That's right. So that we can do what? Bring honor. Oh, my time is almost up. We can bring that honor. You know what? These people in Malachi's day, they don't even realize. They were looking at the wrong thing. You're too busy looking at those out there who are wicked, who appear to be prospering, and still are realizing what you had. You had all God, all, the almighty God in your corner. 
Remember what Moses said to the nation before they went into promised land? He says, now what nation is so nigh unto God? They were nigh to God. God wanted to be their God. God wanted to bless them. But God had become weary of them too, didn't he? They're speaking in their homes and house against God. You don't think God heard that? Yes, he did. God says, and when they were making that accident, now where is the God of justice? Well, God's going to answer that. He's coming. The Lord's coming. Yes, God is coming. Oh, my time's almost up. Woo-wee. Okay. Well, brethren, I enjoyed the study. I hope you did this morning. We, I guess we'll have to continue this next week when we get a chance. Uh, I hope you've been enlightened somewhat. Hope that you strive to offer up acceptable worship to God. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 28, wherefore we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Watch this now. Let us serve God acceptably. Reverence and fear. You hear it? That's right. We, we serve a kingdom that's not going to be moved. You know, the other kingdoms were moved, weren't they? Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greek, Roman. You know, this country might be moved one day, but the Lord's kingdom will never be moved. Mm -mm. No, its foundation is sure. That's right. It is sure. So, all right. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we will continue our study next week in the book of Malachi chapter three as well.